know, I look back at the original Star Wars and I know this is like sacrilege. I don't think it's that great a film. Uh, don't, I'm, don't even bother with that. <laughs> but this is, this, and I'm not going to go say that. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris take off their nostalgia goggles to debate the value of retro games for new generations of gamers. Plus, Ready Player One, the video game voice actor strike, and more. Backwardcompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 86 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hi. I am not the splash of academia. <laughs> we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. He is the splash of academia. Uh, no, I would argue that we're all the splash of academia, because right, we yes, all have at least true. a master's degree in something game-related, mm. so... Well, it's been a long night for me, so at this point, I think I've shut off the academia part of my brain, and I'm running on the pure caffeine part of my brain. Can this I, will be interesting, though. Can I be the yes. squirt gun of academia? Yes. Mm. Thank you, you sort of, You just sort of spritz it in every yeah, now and then? Yeah, just every now and then. Just. Okay. Okay. I like it. Gotcha. I'll be the slow drip of academia. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. And I'll be the bucket of cold water. Uh, Doc, how about, you, uh, <laughs> how about you introduce our uh, media topic of discussion? All right. This is going to be a good one. Do old games, meaning retro games, the early stuff, Pac-Man, right, Galaga, that kind of thing, does it have value to players who were not born or did not play during the time those games were, were around? That's a words, good topic. Old games for new players, or is the new stuff teaching us that same kind of stuff? It's a good thing, and we're going to have to, when we get here, we're going to have to define what you mean by old games. Yeah, Because you course. did sort of give it some sort of boundaries A little here, bit, but a little bit. interesting to see what you yeah. mean. And, of course, the real answer is they have no value whatsoever. No, of course not. They, none, the, the real answer none at is, all. The real answer is, of course they have We're going to trash them all. Right, well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And, uh, oh, <laughs> no, goodbye. <laughs> no. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started with some opening segments, including the other stuff. Believe it or not, we're not always playing games. Every now and then, we like to talk about the other stuff. All right, so Chris, I know you've heard of this book mm-hmm. because you've uh, read it, or rather listened to it, as I did on uh, audio. Ready Player One, a novel mm-hmm. by Ernest Klein. It, boy, it's kind of like a love letter to an 80s that never existed. Is, is that a fair statement? <laughs> um, I wasn't alive for enough of the 80s to say. Oh, okay. So. Well, that's true. That's a good point. So was I, was I uh, misinformed about the 80s by this book? Yeah, it turns out... Um, <laughs> I, I, suddenly, my interest has been peaked now, too, now that I'm talking about the 80s. <laughs> yeah. I'm in it. The, the 80s that is presented, shall we say, is within the context of something called the Oasis, which is a, a fully immersive virtual space. Um, think of it as an MMO that suddenly became more um, interesting than the real world because it's a big dystopian thing you know oh the government sucks and uh, the real world sucks and we have no energy and all the cars just got left parked and rusting and and oh this this world is much much better now how they power all this I don't know but uh, <laughs> we'll just leave that aside what what you end up with is this virtual space this virtual universe that is more real to the inhabitants of it than the real world is Enter our main character, Wade Watts. Um, he is what is called a gunter. And a gunter is an egg hunter, He's as in Easter egg Easter hunter. Egg hunter. Because the creator of this universe um, died. And his multi billion dollar uh, company and the uh, you know all the treasure that comes with it, all of his vast riches, mm-hmm. he has left to the person who will find his Easter egg. And in order to find his Easter egg, you have to find three keys, and you have to find three gates, and you have to beat the game, the hidden game, right? Why have I not heard of this? It sounds actually really good. It sounds really good. It's not. It's well, it depends. Hmm. Jim, you might have some hope of. Uh, 
putting on your nostalgia glasses and and sitting through the very long ad nauseum lists, and I do mean lists mm. of references. Um, Actually, I don't like it when things do that. The I don't problem, like lists yeah. of references. I never See, do. The, the problem that I have... I like hints. I like it's just layered in. Like and it's, it's and it, it's that, too. But the problem is, it, get, it gets into this moment. Klein gets into these mm. moments where it's like, um, yeah, Wade, he had seen all of the movies. He'd seen this movie and that movie and this movie and that movie and that movie and this movie and this movie and that movie. And he'd memorized every line and he knew mm. everything. And, he was, and I'm like, wait a minute. This, this guy's like, what, 16, 17? And, and of course, and yet, the excuse for this is that he's dedicated his entire life to understanding Holiday and being interested in what Holiday was interested in so that he could take whatever hint, whatever references he could in order to get closer to finding the Easter egg. Holiday was obsessed with the 80s for reasons that they sort of kind of explain in the book. Yeah. I think the, the issue that I had with the book overall, and this is one where this is something I listened to when I first got into listening to books on Audible, mm-hmm. um, and so I didn't really know like what was out there and what was worth reading. And so this is one of the books that like I sort of tried early on because it seemed to be recommended. And for about the first third, um, I really wasn't getting that into it like it was kind of I was hanging in there and I was thinking like okay if I don't like it the next time I listen to it I'm going to return it and just Mm -hmm. give up on the book and what happened the next time I listened to it was just enough to keep me interested that I ended up eventually finishing it but I think the problem is it's one of those books that's trying to sort of like appeal to geeks Totally. Um, it's kind of pandering in a way. It's very pandering, actually. And it. Oh, I hate. I don't. I hate when books do that. And it's it's like Stories one of those things where it's like it's going on and on about like, oh man, remember all these great things that we all loved. It's like so the 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 character that they're doing the egg hunt for is obsessed with the eighties, and therefore the main character and all his friends are obsessed with the eighties, and therefore you, the reader, have to be obsessed with the eighties. That's absolutely. And right. they huh. were kind of figuring that a lot of people would like that because like, hey, everybody loves the eighties and had all these great retro games. But it's like, no, there's some of us who really don't care that much. Well, it's like, I like the 80s as much as the next guy, but... But isn't it like you... There's a really fine line there where when, when anytime you do any sort of like referential mm-hmm. um, show or, or game or treatment or anything like that, you have to be very careful because it's very easy to go too far to the point where, like you were saying, yeah. it becomes mm-hmm. pandering and, and he then did. it's just... Mm-hmm. You can't handle like I, I like when when the references are there when it when it works as long as it's it's kind of a little bit more subtle. Yeah. You're playing it like for a few laughs, mm-hmm. um, but if you go over the top with it, I mean, it's, oh, it, I mean, even even set aside the '80s thing. Yeah. He's also pandering in like the Oasis is the ultimate gaming experience, and it contains all the worlds that video gamers know and love. It's got the entire planet of Azeroth somewhere in this universe. It's got this game. It's got that game. It's got all the games. All in the this things, game. man. They're all and there. And it's like, okay, great. <laughs> yeah. There's an entire planet just for arcades. It's called Arcade, and it's got all the arcade games. Hmm. You know, and and it's like okay, I, I get it. The problem I had with it, actually, more than anything else, aside from the lists, hmm. which was just bad writing, um, it was the superlatives. Hmm. In every instance where Wade needed to know the thing that he needed to know, he knew it because he'd memorized that and he'd watched all that. He'd seen every episode of, of Family Ties. He'd he'd already gone through all of the so and so movies. You know, he he had all the Spielberg memorized. He'd all the all the all the all the all the mm-hmm. in every case except right at the end whenever completely contrary to everything that he's done where he's been just a super miracle man the entire time. He goes, "Uh guys, this is not my best game." Mm-hmm. And it and then of course beats it anyway. But it was like, he didn't feel like a real person or a real character. You know what I mean? He was the super geek in virtual space who was a complete loser in his real life. And to be fair, that was something that I think the book did a good job of, where even as it was pandering to geek culture and stuff mm-hmm. like that, it also had some elements of good criticism of geek, geek culture. And yeah, it, obsession. it totally did. Th- this guy, like... You Avatars know, and things like yeah, that. I yeah, I mean, like, whenever you see him in the real world, he is... The definition of dysfunctional. He truly is. Um, and like you know, even he like even with, gets into virtual sex a little bit on yeah. that. And it's like, oh geez, I and, and like in the kind of his character development is like the actually, and this is a little bit not really a spoiler. At the very end of the book, like a thing happens, and the f- closing line is, "For the first time in my life, I didn't want to get back into the oasis." Mm-hmm. And so his character movement is from someone who prefers life in the virtual space to preferring life in the real world. That's very true. And it's kind of a movement from A to B. And so it's interesting in that sense. And it it, it sort of does 
does, like I said, kind of critique some of the more negative aspects of internet culture and of, you know, obsession with the fictional stuff. Because what ended up happening mm-hmm. partially is that the world started going downhill and people just got escapist and let the world keep sliding downhill. But it's stuff like there's a there's a very vague line between the real world and the and the virtual world. For example, there are people who are actually murdered in the actual real world, mm-hmm. and it's a terrible, terrible thing that that, that that occurs. If you die in real life, you die in the game. Yeah, <laughs> and that's the way it's treated. Uh, but it's like, um, that's completely glossed over mm-hmm. as, I'm going to get my revenge on him mm-hmm. by killing his avatar. Yeah. No! <laughs> it's also, yeah, that's the other thing about the Oasis, is like, apparently you have avatars that only have one life. Yeah! That's the worst game design ever. Actually, the Oasis is terribly designed. It's just an awful design. Yeah. It, and like, there's all these like arbitrary rules he added, I think, to make it more dramatic uh-huh. and to make it like more meaningful if you die in the middle of the hunt and that yeah. sort of thing. But even then, it's like, uh, yeah. yeah, like there are other ways you could have dealt with that. I don't know. Way, way, to, way to close it out, though. The biggest problem that I had with with the culture and the characters and the people is that they didn't feel like night. Yeah, they didn't feel like 2044. Kids mm-hmm. who were obsessed with 80s, they felt like 80s kids who'd been teleported to the future mm. and brought into this virtual space. And that was the biggest problem that I had because you cannot absorb a culture mm. and truly be a part of the 80s culture, even if it's in within the context of a simulation, uh, unless you genuinely experienced that culture. Yeah. Um, and so whenever... Uh, whenever somebody walks into into your lounge space and is like, "Oh, it's the living room from Family Ties," mm. respect. You know, <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, okay. I had an actual living room in the actual '80s and was an actual kid. <laughs> and I can tell you, Transformers was on TV or GI Joe, and I was playing with Legos and I was doing all these things, but it was different than that. And this is an idealized. Um, fantasy that doesn't account for the fact that the themes we were dealing with in those shows were a reaction to the fact that we had just come off of a big war that we lost and we were now dealing with AIDS. Mm -hmm. And that was the 80s. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's the reason why we had that escapism. We didn't have that escapism because the 80s were cool. Mm -hmm. And that was a fundamental lacking element within the context of it, Mm. taking the actual themes of the 80s and bringing them in. The truth is, the solution to the the problems the world was having, nothing gets solved at the end of it. Uh, And that's even brought up. Mm. I mean... There, there, there's a little there's bit of really talk no about, resolution. Like, what are we going to do? Like the things that they like start trying to talk about, like, oh, well, we're going to try to solve this problem yeah. and we win all the prize money. I'm going to like write that. a great big check <laughs> and uh, solve all the world's problems. <laughs> and and, and Wade just is like, that's not going to work. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, they kind of acknowledge that too. They're kind of like, you know, we can at least start working in the right direction, that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, and, and it sounds like we're coming across very harsh on the book. I think it was a solid read, and I know that there are a lot of people in our audience who'd probably really enjoy it. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It just, there were enough things about it that kind of like bugged me. That's mm-hmm. kind of like what I remember. Um, but I mean, it wasn't, I, I, I got through the whole book. I tell you what the best thing about the book is, though mm. listening to Will Wheaton read it mm-hmm. in the audiobook version. Mm-hmm. And there's a few referential meta things where Will uh, yeah. talks he, about he's, himself he's as being a little codger yeah, and, yeah. and that sort of thing. And, he, you know, the holodeck and the Star Trek and that sort of thing. And that's fun. Mm-hmm. That's a lot. Of, he does a great job of reading that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and the way that he almost sarcastically slogs through the long lists himself. You can kind of hear in his voice, like, oh, here we go, through another list. Um, I really felt like, okay, <laughs> this is a narrator that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm simpatico with. So, yeah. so um, I mean, you know, read the back of the book, or read the back of the cover text, see if it's something you might be interested in. Give it a read um, if you are interested, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it was worth the audible credit for me, man. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It totally was. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. We talked uh, last week about the the Game Awards and some of the positives and negatives of the event. Man, that um, was a long time ago. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, one thing I did want to go over again, kind of just because I didn't really talk about it much. Um, Nolan North, he, he portrayed... Um, Speaking of performance art from last week, mm-hmm. um, Nathan Drake from Uncharted. Oh, okay. And so he won the award for, they had an award for best uh, performance in a game. Mm-hmm. It's, it's Again, it's becoming so much more common now. They can have awards for it. And uh, Nolan North won the award. Mm-hmm. And when he came up to give his speech, um, interestingly, he actually talked about and referenced um, the, the SAG-AFTRA strike 
for uh, voice actors oh, in video games. Yeah, yeah. And it seemed like he was actually dissing them, which turned out he wasn't. It was it was a vague comment. But uh, uh, what he said was, and let me see if I can pull it up here, because I actually agree with what he was saying. Um, I want to thank a group of people at Naughty Dog. It's them as a whole. I'm hearing a lot of talk lately about how performance matters, and it does. The performance of every designer, every programmer, every artist, every hardworking, talented person at that office. Not only Naughty Dog, but all developers that I've worked with, but Naughty Dog in particular because I've been with them so long. That performance is so important. They are talented. They are so hardworking. And their performance matters more than mine. So I'm going to say that again (laughs) because I think this is something that we all need to remember. Um, Their performance matters more than mine. What, What point is he making here? The gameplay is more important than performance. Yeah, that's important to understand in this day and age with all this talk going back and forth because without their performance, my performance would not would not only not matter, it wouldn't exist. Hmm. Wow. So so did he say he was going to say it again, or did you say you were going to say it again? I said I'm going to oh, say okay, it again. Right. I, I specifically wanted to... Didn't know if you were quoting that. him no, on the I said That one part I wasn't quoting. Um, so he did later come back and say he does support um, he does support the strike, he does support the efforts of the voice acting community. Sure. But I think the, the point that he's making here is a really important one, and we need to be really... like We need to... And I'll be careful in the way that I put this, too. But um, while I think that it's, it's interesting that we're moving in this direction of, perform, of performance art um, and, and performances in games, I think it's really neat what we can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it works in some games. Like Until Dawn does a great job of it. We've seen some of that hints about what that might be in Death Stranding. Um, we've seen that, of course, in, in Uncharted. And it's, it's, a, it's a big part of modern games now. But there's still, it's still a game. There's still it still has to be there's still a ton of people that that are on this project that we don't we don't even hear about them and I think it's important to remember those people too and I and I feel like we are in danger of moving away from um, a focus on the studio and a focus on you know the people that are actually putting the games together mm. to focus on the celebrity oh, aspect that makes sense, yeah. of the perform and, and it's that's, a lot like Hollywood honestly yes and that's what I think. That's actually the point that I that I feel that Nolan North was making there was yeah. the importance of it's 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 not just me. I'm just a guy that's doing a voice that doing a performance for this character, you know. And of course, he's not saying that performance isn't important. He's saying that all these other things are important, and they're even more important because without without the studio, without the director, without the the writers and the programmers and the um, artists, you're not going to actually have a game. That makes sense. We've talked a little bit about working conditions just for game developers, you know, um, like Konami was an example of like some really bad conditions and stuff like that, but, you know, long hours, um, Mm -hmm. you know, pay that's lacking, benefits that are lacking is like a big problem in a lot of game development circles. And and it's, it's to the point where it feels, at least from what I've seen, that the the voice actors that are complaining about and the performance actors that are complaining about wanting um, essentially more money is what it all boils down to. Um, they want more money. Um, and yet we have programmers and artists that are working long hours, well over 40 hours a week. We're mm-hmm. talking, you know, 60 hours a week plus on, on these game companies in poor conditions to the point where they'll be brought in and many of them will be let go mm-hmm. after – like they don't have any sort of job security. Um, they're not really being paid what they should be getting paid for the hours that they're working – and yet the ones who are striking are the people that come in and just do a performance for like a few hours and they're done. So it just to me it feels – makes sense. I, I'm not bashing – again, I'm not trying to bash the actors. I'm not saying they're not talented. Mm-hmm. But when you, when, you, when you compare the two about who's putting in the work and who feels like they actually should be striking and getting some more mm-hmm. restitution here and they're not versus the ones that are, it, it kind of feels like – you know, it, I, I get this experience of like, well, you know, boo-hoo for you mm. kind of kind of feeling. That's fair. You know? there's, and there's, there's a little bit more to it, and we, we had this debate a while right, back right. when they first authorized the strike, and yeah. we, we had a, a long conversation about that, so we won't go too much into that Yeah, that was a good now. episode. Go mm-hmm. check that one out. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people would argue sort of on the side of the voice actors that it's – yes, there are the celebrity voice actors, the big names that kind of play into it. But there are also a lot of like lower-ranking yeah. voice actors who are being subjected to like kind of tough conditions. I mean voice acting for games, there's a lot of dialogue and there's a lot right. of screening yeah. and there's a lot of destroying your voice for I th- the next I think I think so. what gets me – no, I agree. I agree with that. I just think whenever I hear it, I feel like where's the conversation for – the poor conditions of those actually making the game. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's a conversation that needs to happen, and it still isn't happening. Mm-hmm. 
um, when is it going to happen? I mean, when, yeah. are, when are we actually going to have that conversation? advocate for the people. And, no, I'm, I mean, no, it's, but, it's a good point, and people have been talking about it a little bit, but just it's just like, not as public. Right, but and it's I not think part of public. it is because it's not, voice acting is so closely related to acting right. that, like, they're kind of, they're in it, like, a, the, 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 there's a Venn diagram of cultures. Mm-hmm. And many of them are actors. Yeah. And, yeah. and it goes back to the, mm-hmm. yeah, and that's the thing. The ones that are actually actors in other shows and stuff, they don't need more money from Well, they've got the clout to do it. So I think the way that that's going to happen, to answer your question that you almost didn't ask, is how how can we make this happen? The answer is the actors need to get up and stand up for the people who are providing those jobs for them in the first place. And mm-hmm. that's the devs. The, yeah, that yeah. team of 100 to 400 and devs. Which is kind of what Nolan North did when he made this right. speech. Right. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. And they, it, yes, to take this back full circle, that's why I kind of have to applaud him for mm. um, recognizing all of those people. In that sense, yeah. I completely agree. This is Wishlist, our most anticipated games that are either unreleased or we haven't had a chance to play. All right, so it's been a little while since we've done the Wishlist. Um, you'll recall that when we first introduced it was at our last holiday special, and the theme there was um, games that we would, you know, give to other people as gifts and why. Um, and we're probably going to do that again for our uh, holiday special coming up in a week or two. Merry Christmas! Um, woohoo! Uh, but in the meantime, we wanted to do uh, a sort of more standard version of Wishlist where we're just going to talk about the games that we are looking forward to or had, haven't had a chance to play. Doing so a more standard version of something we've never done before. <laughs> no, we, we, yeah, <laughs> it's, just, it's been a little while. Oh. So, it's been um, like a year. So I guess the one that I wanted to open up with is um, Steins Gate Zero. Uh, so I talked a little bit about Steins Gate and uh, even mentioned it a little bit last week. Um, really became a fan of that game, and I've been getting more into the transmedia. I watched the anime and that sort of thing uh, after having finished the it. M&A? The m and The m and yes. Um... And so I, w- I was looking a little bit at their kind of transmedia stuff to see, like, you know, what else exists in that universe. And um, there were a few spinoffs and, you know, kind of one of them was like a, a dating sim or something like that that's like based on the property, which kind of seemed kind of stupid. And then there was another game that was, you know, side stories that were parallel with the first game. And nothing really, like nothing else to really to continue the series. Um, but I was very excited to find out that there was actually uh, a new game coming out, Steins Gate Zero, that is a follow up to the first game. Um, and it just so happened that the North American localization was being released to like, you know, two day or two weeks from the time that I found out. So on the one hand, it was much, much closer and I didn't have to wait as long as I'm sure a lot of fans did. Uh, but at the same time, it was kind of like, well, I kind of want more now and I have to wait two weeks. <laughs> and of course, now that I've actually, I've bought it and I've downloaded it, but I haven't played it yet because I just uh, haven't had a chance. I haven't had that free time that I had when I was first looking at, into it. Who does? Um, but I'm very interested in the story. Uh, you know, without spoiling anything that happens in the first game, you know, it's kind of funny. It's a time travel story, so it's hard to say if it's a prequel or a sequel, really. Um, That's fair. But there are events that happen that are kind of mentioned but never explored that enable the the ending that you have. Um, so basically, in order to get the good ending in the first game, a bad ending had to have happened. And then what happens in that bad ending, sort of post, you know, the end of the first game, is what enables... A good ending, and so this game is exploring that. So uh, I actually mentioned this to our friend Will Parsons, and he was saying that he wasn't particularly interested because basically it's a whole game about taking the worst possible world line <laughs> <laughs> and exploring that. And actually, I think that's what's really intriguing about it to me is that like there's there's some there's some emotionality in the characters, what happens to them in the game that you know ends up being explored here. Um, that sounded like it could make for really powerful fiction. Um, and so when I found out that that's what they're going to be exploring in this game, I got really excited. So yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to report back once I've had a chance to play it. Um, do you guys have any other games that you haven't checked out yet looking forward to? Yeah. Um, so I'm actually really looking forward to it. This was announced during the PlayStation experience um, that they were finally bringing it worldwide. Um, Yakuza Zero. Mm. So this is a game series um, that I've kind of been interested in a while, but they typically don't come to America, or when they do, they come so late that I... I don't have a chance to pick it up. Um, it's basically, it's kind of like a Japanese GTA, in a sense. Um, it's by Sega, mm-hmm. and essentially you are a, a Yakuza member, mm-hmm. and uh, you're just in, like, you know, in Japan, and it's just, you know, it's got a storyline. So I'm, I'm interested. I like open-world games, mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm a huge fan of open-world kind of action games. Mm-hmm. And this feel, seems like another one that I can really sink my teeth into and play for a long time. And it's actually coming early next year, so in January. Cool. Really? Yeah, yeah. Not too long or late. Wait. Mm-hmm. It actually came out originally um, in March of 2015 in Japan, but it's finally going to come worldwide to America. 
<laughs> Worldwide to America. <laughs> <laughs> Worldwide to America. Is it out in Australia yet? Uh, Will it even get to Australia? Well, <laughs> never, never, ever. Australia, I mean, it's not part of the world because the world is just USA. So. The, the world is the northern hemisphere. <laughs> I say is I completely, you know, ignore South America and Africa or most of Africa. Right. <laughs> and Australia. No, it's actually coming um, basically to every, like, all the other regions, essentially. Mm-hmm. So whatever, however many regions they can. I think I think it's just North America and Europe, actually. Probably is coming to Australia as well. Mm-hmm. You got anything on your wish list, Doc? Yeah, you know, uh, I guess the low-hanging fruit easy answer for me would be Horizon Zero Dawn. So I won't talk about that, <laughs> uh, especially since it's 2017. Instead, I'll talk about The Last Guardian. Uh, you know, we, we did a uh, Try by Trash last week, mm-hmm. and uh, that the, I had to choose between those two, and then I actually chose to... to to just try Last Guardian, but I don't know, that's a little disingenuous. <laughs> Honestly, I, I am looking forward to the game. I'm definitely going to buy it. Um, and it's one of those that takes me to a different headspace in, in gaming, you yeah. know what I mean? Uh, along with the other Team Ico games, uh, I really feel like you're, I'm playing in an interactive art space and enjoy that experience. Again, we talked last week about experience. And so um, that, to me is a a lore that i love uh, the the it almost feels like it's it's crumbling history that if you don't access it quickly it's going to be gone mm. that's the way that world feels to me when you enter into that space you, you're like there was this magnificent wonderful civilization here and something horrible happened and we don't know what it is mm-hmm. and this is going to give you a peek into that and you're going to learn and uh, I really like playing as uh, just kind of that, that, that little boy aspect the wonder of mm-hmm. the walking through a space that's so big so much bigger than you so much beyond you I think that the their whole aesthetic captures that in a, in a wonderful way. And their gameplay style is interesting, too. It's very sort of experiential and exploratory. Yes, yes it is. You can't like, really fail. Th- there's very little dialogue, if any, uh-huh. in these games. And so what it really comes down to is not being told, hey, here's a mechanic and here's how you play it. Mm-hmm. It really just comes down to figuring things out as you go. The game's kind of teaching yeah. you how as you play, which kind of ties in, in a little bit to, I think, the discussion we're going to have and here. And, man, this is a boy and his dog story. So how could mm-hmm. I possibly <laughs> not... Or boy and his griffin or whatever yeah. the heck that thing is. <laughs> Hippogriff, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Hippogriff, yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited about it. I, I really think uh, that that's the one... If you know, if that's the one I get in my stocking, I'll, I'll be very happy. Cool. Intent. Yeah. <laughs> it's time for Game Show, where the backward compatible crew play a game show kind of game on their gaming show. What sort of crazy game show challenges in store this week on Game Show? Let's find out right now on Game Show. This is a, a new game we're trying out. I'm calling it Would You Rather. Yes, I would. All right. Um, and I would not. This 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 particular time it's kind of a test run. So I've got one question, but I think it's a good meaty question. We're going to have a little bit of a discussion about it. Um, so the question I'm going to pose to you guys, and actually ties in quite nicely with our meaty topic today, is this: Assuming that something happens that only allows you to play games from a particular era, um, like the all of the games are kind of being erased from existence, would you rather only be able to play games released before 1996? Only be able to play games released between 1996 and 2016. Oh my! Or only be able to play games released from 2017 on. And why? Well, I mean, I'm a huge fan of. of I'll, I'll start first. I'm a huge fan of retro games. So yeah, you are. Um, that being said, I still have to pick the 2017 and beyond, just because of the beyond factor. You're you're <laughs> literally saying from 2017 until the day I die. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No matter what happens, I'm going to get more games. Mm-hmm. And so to, and. Plus, I've already played most of those old games, so it's not like I'm going to... Those memories are being erased or something. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm going to have to take that just for the reason of, you know, I don't know where gaming is going. I mean, we talk a lot about where it might go. That surprises me. But I don't know where it's going. I don't know where it's going. So I'd I'd like to find out. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, and I, I trashed 1999. You said 1996 to like 2016. So buy trash. I'll buy 2017. And I'll, <laughs> I'll trash 96, 2016. And I'll try, and I'll try uh, 1996. I've already tried. No, I'm not, I say that. I have. There's a ton of games that I loved in that period too. I'm just saying. I my my period that that to me holds um, 
that I, I loved I love going back to those games the mm-hmm. most is the period before like the sort the, of golden age yeah of, of retro games yeah. those, those, that's the area that I go back to the most often but it doesn't mean I don't go back to games um, you know past that you heard but, it here folks yeah you, Jim you, hates games <laughs> <laughs> I gotta I gotta go for the future man I gotta go for the future a- 86 po- uh, episodes into the podcast we yeah. learned that uh, Jim hates games yeah <laughs> so presumably <laughs> so presumably like all remakes and, and reskins and digital re-releases are off limits let's right? assume that yeah okay cause like I just found out that Full Throttle is about to have a, a HD remake and I am st- Stoked to use exactly the right word because mm. um, that is one of my all-time favorite games of all time. If you missed that Lucas Arts classic, um, do it. When I had a uh, 486, man, I got my my 486 all-in-one compact. That was the one game that I huh. uh, you know popped on to get. I've never played Full Throttle. It's great. It's worth it. You are a biker mm. in the post-apocalypse, and uh, it's just amazing. It's redundantly awesome. It's the all-time favorite of all time. Yeah, no kidding, right? <laughs> uh, but it's one of those it's one of those classic Lucas Art designs where it's point and click. And you walk around and you try to solve the puzzle, and and it's just it's an adventure game, and and you can't die and you can't fail, but there are also some action sequences on your bike and things like it's just really well done. Um, that said, the art is has been updated with it while staying true, and it's just wonderful. So this is hard for me because if I'm not allowed to say play re-releases, yeah, mm-hmm. if I'm not allowed to play the re-releases, then that means I can't ever do that. And one of the things I love about the idea of retro is I, I actually love the idea of retro more than I like actual retro. Mm. I very, very rarely put, play old games. I very, very rarely replay games. And I mean like current games that mm. I own. Um, I will sell games. I usually have about six games on my shelf at any given time um, in, in terms of the physical hard copies. Now the digital stuff you can't sell back. So it's in my library and I never reinstall it. I never pull it back up again. Um, but I enjoy... Very much enjoy the idea of the new experience. The um, that first hour of a game is exciting to me, yeah. right? So one of the reasons I enjoy a PlayStation Plus, uh, you know, subscription is because I never know what the free game of the month is going to be. And I'm like, ooh, what? What am I getting? Okay, the, yeah, this is crap. Um, and, and I played <laughs> it, and and now I'm going d- to d- uninstall it. But that's okay. Next month I'll have something new. Um, and then every now and then you get this really great gym, and so it's like. Uh, I'm I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to agree with you. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm gonna go with the new stuff because that's that's what I am as a gamer. Um, I would be happy to never play another game um, that I've already played as long as I can continue to play new games. Mm-hmm. That's that's really what it boils down to for me. Gotcha. Yeah, and and you know it's funny because we you know we just talked about Ready Player One. Mm-hmm. That's actually one of the problems that I had with that was that idea of. Um, let's go back in and 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 you know, our meaty topic today is inspired by that actually <laughs> by that idea of the, does the old stuff have value for 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 a new generation mm-hmm. um, and you know I I was alive during the Pac Man era I was very tiny but I was alive <laughs> when Pac Man came out and I just I have no desire to go play Pac Man yeah. I just, really? it's not a thing no it's just not a thing I have interest in doing Fr- frankly none of the old NES stuff n- none of it appeals to me. I don't do what you do. I don't I don't download the old ROMs. I don't I don't play the old games. I just I don't. I just I, I, I could go the rest of my life and never play Galaga and be totally fine. If I never pick up I'm not a huge Galaga fan. Well okay, but let me put it let me, let me put it shockingly. Yeah. I could never pick up the original Zelda again and be totally fine. Oh that's terrible. I honestly <laughs> That's terrible. I enjoy I enjoyed Zelda. Um, I downloaded it for my Wii when we first came out, mm-hmm. and I played a couple of hours and was like, yeah, this is cool. It brings me back. Never beat it. And that means that I haven't beaten Zelda or really genuinely played Zelda since the 80s whenever it first came out. So that's not who I am as a gamer. So what I'm hearing is... Um do not get Doc a NES Classic for Christmas. <laughs> Correct, actually. I, I, even though it's like 50 bucks for the NES Classic, yeah. I, I'd pick it up for an hour and be like, ha-ha, and I'd be done with it. Mm. I would never pick that thing up again. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Cool. Let's say that 2017 on is not an option. Games are just going extinct now. Um, well, so why'd they go extinct? Just because. Because this, Chris is an ass. It, it, it's hypothetical. Oh, okay. So let's say that there are going to be no more games made, and you have to pick between only being play, able to play 1996 and before, or 1996 to now. What would you pick? So yeah. Jim, you already said pre-96. Well, right? yeah, I mean, it's hard. Well, it's, it's hard to pick because, you know, I have so many great games that I like 
recently too. So it's not like I mean I, I like games all over the place. I'd probably take the before and kind of for the same reason, honestly. And that's there's more of them. You know, if you go 1996 and before, um, there's a lot there's a lot of games that I still haven't played from earlier earlier periods too. Mm-hmm. That. You know, I could play. I could go back and play. I could I could discover that I haven't played yet. Mm-hmm. So that's why I would take those older games. Um, whereas the games between nine, 1996 and, two, and and now, I've been such an avid gamer during that period that there's very very few games that I that I would actually have interest in playing mm-hmm. that I haven't already played. Mm-hmm. So it's for that same reason. It's like I've I've already played them. Um, I think that I could go back and discover something new in that earlier period much more likely than I could in the 1996 hmm. 2016. That makes sense. That's why. That's why I pick it. That's the only reason why I pick mm-hmm. it. Well, For me, it's all about. It, it, similar to you, Doc, it is about the new experiences. It's just yeah. I also like going back and playing old games that I played. Before. The nostalgia, right? Yeah. Well, and, well, and I just I enjoy it too. It's not just for that feeling of nostalgia. Also, I. I I also have fun doing it. I, it. It's different sort of gaming experience to what we get with new with modern sure. games. It feels different. It plays different. It, it's not. And we'll talk about that when we get to our media topic. It's not the same. Um, it's not the same experience. I mean, yeah, you don't play those games for the same reason. Right. That's definitely right. You're playing a video game, but yet, you know, it's almost like it's. You almost want to call them two different things because mm-hmm. their the experience is so different. I've yeah. always kind of felt like they're right. they're somewhere between kind of board games and video games. Yeah. They're like they're digital board games or digital recreation, like things that we would have done outside of video games that we now have turned into video games mm-hmm. because we didn't really know what video games were capable of that we couldn't otherwise sure. do. Before we if that bef- makes sense. Right, and, and we can return to this. We'll put a pin in it temporarily. Mm-hmm. But it's almost like the comparison between, you know, a board game or like a P and P, pen and paper yeah, RPG. Yeah. It's that sort of difference mm-hmm. to me. It's like Actually, the, I would look at right? I would look at pen and paper versus MMOs and see how the MMOs were influenced by the pen and papers. And then now we've got this new generation of pen and papers that are being influenced, influenced by, by the MMOs. Yeah. MMOs. Mm-hmm. Wild, right? It's yeah. <laughs> so, Tadak, how about you? Uh, oh, that's easy for me. Ninety, you said six. Ninety six. <laughs> yeah, ninety six. See, I graduated high school in ninety four, mm. uh, but I really started. I mean, I did community college for a couple of years, but I, I, I transferred over to a university in ninety six. So that year is a very specific year. It's on the nose for me, and I, I'm like, um, everything between then and now. If if I just had that entire library, I could be content. I could be fine. Mm. This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. All right, so if you haven't caught Pokemon Go in the last few uh, you know weeks, see what I did there, you might want to give it a chance again. Um, if you set it aside or if you originally liked it and were frustrated with some of the things that got stripped out uh, when the servers were having trouble, that sort of a thing, I, I got to tell you, it's running really, really smooth, and a lot of the original functionality is back and better. Number one is tracking. Uh, now what you can do is you can tag something that's over in that little box on the right, you know, the nearby uh, section, and you can actually click on uh, whatever little guy it is you're, you're wanting to track, and it will not only tell you uh, like how, how far away generally he is, but it will also tell you uh, what Pokestop is nearest to and how to get there and show you and does a really cool zoom out and zoom in and that sort of a thing. It's brought back that original I'm going to go get this thing in this direction element that was there. I think it's really, really cool. And I like the fact that uh, it's tying everything back into what's probably the most important mechanic of the game, which is the Pokestops. Um, And it drives you to Pokestops, and it makes you want to congregate together. Um, You know, one of the things that I think has been criticized is the idea that uh, you're playing this game sort of by yourself. And what's interesting is there's a lot of elements to it, like the, the fighting at the gyms, where if you do team up, it's actually a better experience as a team experience. But what's interesting is a lot of people just missed out on that because they didn't coordinate it. Um, Now, a lot of that was derived from the game uh, Ingress that it was originally built, you know, off of and around and that sort of a thing. And I think that they're recognizing now uh, more of what Pokemon is about um, and less about what some of the other augmented reality games that have been in the past, or uh, you know, vir- virtual reality games, or however you want to, however you want to tame Lo- locative games is really what I'm talking about, map driven and all of that. So now we've got companions, that's cool. Now we've got uh, 
Pokestops that are kind of more meaningful. Now we've got uh, location tracking is back on. If you haven't given it a try, give it a try again because I really think that um, a lot of the things that they're bringing into it have a lot of potential. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. Do old games have value for new players? Well, um, let me answer your question with a question. With another question. Yeah. Um, do and, I, and I'm going to change one word, and it's going to be an important word, but I'm going to change one word for you. The no, I'm going to change the word old. Okay. To classic. Classic. And I'm sure. going to say. Do classic? I'm going to change it to a different media, though. Yeah, yeah. Do classic films have value for new viewers? Ah, excellent question. Does does uh, say classic um, art, like I'm talking fine art, like uh, paintings, mm-hmm. sculpture? Do those have value in a culture? Does uh, classic literature does that have value to new readers? None whatsoever. So I think my answer would be. Um, if you just blanket say, do old games have value? It's like, well, okay, which old game are you talking about? Sure. That's what I think you have to answer. Yeah. So, no, I'm not going to say that, that there's value in going back and playing every single old game. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just because it's old, that it somehow has value. Of course not. But at the same, by that same token, there are plenty of older games and, and old games that are classics for one reason or another. Either they're extremely influential, mm-hmm. um, say, like the original Super Mario Brothers, or... Um, they're, they still are. They still present. Um, they still have, well, fun. I guess you could say they're basically they're still entertaining. Right. And they also could you could potentially learn something from them mm-hmm. that we may not necessarily be doing in, in modern games. And it's the same thing with classic films. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I'm also, in addition to being a gamer, I'm also you know a film buff. I watch a lot of films, and a lot of the films that I watch are older films too that I've never seen because you know there were a lot of great films that were made before I was born, mm-hmm. or that were made after I was born, but I was just too young to appreciate them. Right. <laughs> so. There's a lot that, that, that I learned from going back and watching old films, I think, of just about, about storytelling and about the nature of film. And it's the same thing with video games. That I, when I discover a game that I hadn't played before, an older game, um, especially when with video games, it's like the, the experimental period. It's like going back and watching a movie from like the 1940s. Right. <laughs> There's this experimental period if you're going back into um, the 80s, particularly the, er- the early 80s. And even you know in the late seventies as well mm-hmm. in video games like that's the the arcade era, um, kind of the golden era of the arcades as well as the early era of eight bit. Right before things were established, before we had rules, and before before games like Super Mario Bros came in um, and said, which was not the first game on the NES by the way. The NES, the NES had many games before that. Yeah. Nor was it a console game. I mean, I'm sorry. Nor, nor was it a. Uh, what am I trying to say? Cabinet game. Nor was it a cabinet game. Right, right. I just mean Super Mario Brothers was, sometimes we think of it because in the U.S. it was the first game we got, but 8-Bit had been around for a while. Well, that's true, yeah. Like, it, like the, it was not the in first game. In the arcades. Game. <laughs> right, but also at home. The Famicom had several, many, many games before the Super Mario, Super Mario Brothers. That was a later game. In, for, it's just that we didn't get the NES until, well, like... What we are we talking about? Are we talking about humanity or are we yes. talking about America? Cause I'm talking about game, gaming, the video game industry. Okay. Culture, like like the game itself was built off the backs of other games. Yeah, and but, it, it, but it, it happened in it happened in Japan a lot sooner than it happened here, mm-hmm. and and sort of still does in a no, way. No, right, right. <laughs> but um, I, the the point the point that I'm making is that um a, that early period of um, Famicom games of eight bit games mm-hmm. um and the arcade games were very experimental, and even even after uh, Super Mario Brothers, before everybody kind of caught on, right. and other games like that, like Legend of Zelda, um, there was a lot of experimentation in games, yeah. and there were a lot of things that caught on that we le- that we later used to sort of build the basis, the basic structure of games, like what is a platformer, before mm-hmm. we had genres, before we knew what a genre was, before we knew what a, we talked about like a stealth game, before there was a stealth mm-hmm. game, before we had that, what was what is a stealth game, what makes a game a stealth oh, it's game? it's just an adventure so, game. Yeah. Right, so these things, are, or, or what is an adventure game? You know, what makes an adventure game, right? right? What makes an action game? What makes a platformer? What are the differences between these games? And so before, before people felt like they had to put their game in a box to sell it, and I mean a... a 
not a literal box, but a metaphorical box. <laughs> no. Right? <laughs> You're always using boxes. Right. Before they had to put the game into like mm-hmm. and say, this is a this is a platformer that's kinda like this and you sort of do this. Before we had that, um, when you could just make a game and it's like gonna be all these things and mm-hmm. it's just its own its own experience, um, you got to experiment a lot more. And so there's a lot of these ideas that were sort of lost along the way. And I think that there's value going back and playing some of those games, even for the ones that aren't necessarily good. Right. Mm-hmm. If they at least try something different. Because okay. there's and I, I think you'd say the same thing about film. There's plenty of films. I go back to some, some that I watch, and I'm like, "Well, this is a really interesting idea, and they did some really cool things with cinematography." I don't think this is. I don't. I didn't enjoy the film, mm-hmm. right? On, on in terms of the way the story was told, but in terms of what it tried to do, it's very interesting. It's like a, like an artifact, a cultural artifact. Okay, so here here's where it gets a little bit. Um, gee, what's the right word for this? Uh, muddy. Mm-hmm. Okay. Games, by their very nature, are meant to be played. Yes. Right? There's an interactive medium. Yes. Media, whatever. Um, it is medium. It is medium. Uh, they are interactive media, is my point. Mm. So, Pac-Man, is it possible for me, from a scholarly standpoint, to understand everything that I need to know significantly about Pac-Man without actually having played let's say, a hundred hours of Pac-Man. Oh, of course. But How many hours do I need to have played of Pac-Man in many. order to have had that experience? Yeah, I would say not many, but it, it depends on the game, of course. But when we're talking about a game like Pac-Man, mm-hmm. where um, essentially it's, it's a maze game, yes. and um, yes, they, they, they had different mazes at, for different levels, but it's essentially the same experience each time. So really, if you sit down and you play Pac-Man for like a couple of hours... You, I, I feel that you've experienced Pac-Man to a pretty much the extent you're going to experience. So you're, you're not saying really that there's anymore. no need to beat Pac-Man? No. Well, first of all, you can't even beat Pac-Man. Yes, not, you can. Well, okay. Ready, ready Player One actually describes yeah. in detail. Yes, yes and that's the trap I was setting for <laughs> you, in fact. But there is a perfect score. Yes, and that's that's exactly the scenario that is set up by the author in that book. Um, Wade, the main character, yeah. comes into this uh, on arcade. He comes yeah. into it. He finds it. It's it's an Easter egg. Not not the Easter egg, but an Easter egg. And basically, he has to, he has to get a perfect yeah. score in Pac-Man and the and, and the high score is 50 points away from that so the only way that he can get the high score himself is to get a perfect game yeah. and, and, and he says something like um, only six games ever have been recorded blah yeah. blah blah and of course he's Mr. Perfect so he's able to do it oh spoilers um, <laughs> but the way that he does it is he knows the exploits he knows right. the corner that he can uh, put Pac-Man into where he won't get hurt mm-hmm. uh, for 15 minutes so that he can go pee right. uh, he doesn't explain how he how he pees in the real world when he's jacked. I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> uh, the point is that, you know, he he has this, I already have played Pac-Man and I'm so very good at Pac-Man and I am the, I'm the Pac-Man god that I can have a perfect score in Pac-Man and be the pac Do you need that level of fanaticism in order to understand what Pac-Man achieved? Um, I've seen the Mona Lisa. Yeah. Uh, I stood in front of the Mona Lisa for five minutes, along with about 250 other people in the Grand Gallery that she is in. Um, Not to be confused with the Grand Gallery. And uh, took a very silly meta photo of uh, everyone in the crowd taking photos of her, which was a lot of fun. (laughs) Then I went around behind her and took a picture of the picture that's behind her, because she's on a flat wall, and and it's uh, a naked woman turned away, so you can see her butt, which... Had to have been intentional, I'm yeah. just saying. Um, so, you know, there's all these weird little things. And that was my experience of seeing the Mona Lisa. And it was behind glass. And there was a rope. And there was all these other things. You know, how many times do I need to go see the Mona Lisa in order to understand and appreciate the Mona Lisa when I can really just get online, pull up a, a, a nice picture of it in, in much, much larger in, in my terms because I'm closer to the monitor. And I can even zoom in. I can spend I so, can spend hours and hundreds of hours examining so me, her, reading her and all that right. stuff. You see where I'm going with this? Well, I think... Can't I just read about Pac-Man or, well, no, or you, watch first Pac-Man? Of all, first of all, you can't just read about or watch it because, like you said, games are an interactive medium. So okay. the comparison there would be instead of you actually seeing the Mona Lisa, someone described it to you. 
I mean, that's basically what happens. Like when you watch a Let's Play, mm-hmm. you're, you're, it's someone else's experience. So you're saying as soon as I pulled up that first um, picture, I think there's a difference. I, I'd seen the Mona Lisa, n- sort of. But see, and that's where I think the the comparison with games could be. For example, Pac Man. If you play Pac Man um, through an emulator at home with like uh, your PlayStation controller mm-hmm. that you've like set up for your emulator, um, versus actually playing it on the arcade cabinet. Yeah. And that's the difference. The table cabinet. So that's... The one where you've got your pizza slice on the screen, it right? depends. It depends on which version of Pac-Man we're talking yeah. about. But my point is, there's a difference between the authentic experience and sort of the um, simulated experience, I guess, for lack of a better word. Okay. So it's like, yes, you can look at a picture of the Mona Lisa in a book mm-hmm. or online, um, but it's not going to be quite the same experience as seen seen in person the actual photograph. Just like how you can play an, emu- an emulated version with a different control scheme. Because remember, these are interact this, these are interactive. So right. if you're if you're using a different controller than the way the game was originally designed to be played, you're not really getting the authentic That's experience. True. Um, so I think that that if you really want to understand Pac Man and what like Pac Mania and Pac Fever, which was mm-hmm. a huge thing of the eighties. It was, yeah. Good reason to bring that game up specifically. It was massive. So yes, there's definitely some reading you have to do, especially if you want to be like a, a game scholar. There's a lot of things you have to read and understand about Pac Man and its impact yes. on you know the games industry if you really want to know. But no, do I think you have to actually beat Pac Man? No. Do I think you have to play like a hundred hours or even ten hours of Pac Man to understand it? No. But you do have to actually, if you really want to say I've played Pac-Man. I know what I know Pac-Man. You have to actually have played on the arcade cabinet on a arcade cabinet of Pac-Man. You have to have have the controls, um, you have to have a joystick, the buttons and you're actually playing it on with a CRT monitor with the with the way, the same sounds that we would get from, you know, the old the old style speakers <laughs> everything. <laughs> yes. So it's not quite the same experience if you're playing like a port of it, say like the the, the um, NES port of Pac-Man, is a different experience. You know, the the, ma- the mazes aren't quite the same, the sounds aren't quite the same, um, and of course the controls are very different because the tro- controllers are different. So now that doesn't mean that you can't. I'm not going to say that you're not going to have any understanding of the game. There's 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 like there's different levels, like we said, with same thing with Mona Lisa, or same thing with like watching a film. You know. Um, <laughs> I was actually just about to draw another parallel to film. Um, you know, and you, you mentioned the classics. I just want to make a quick side point before I get to what yeah. I was going to mention here. Um, I think it is important to note that it is the classics we're talking about because uh, a lot of things. I think one of the reasons people tend to have nostalgic nostalgia goggles is because we remember all the good stuff and filter out all the bad stuff. Yeah, right. 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 People, There's plenty of people bad love you know music oh, from Lord. the seventies and eighties yeah. because we only hear the hits. Yeah. Um, and we never hear all the crap that was in between. Of course, and, and there's be, tons of crap. Yeah, it's going to be the crap. same thing, you know. Well, the right. '70s, sure, but not in the '80s. <laughs> exactly. Just, just like this year. I mean, we, we were we're going to remember on, on all the games that came out this year that are great that we enjoyed, and mm-hmm. we're going to be thinking about them. We're probably thinking of games that we really enjoyed this year in our heads right now. No man's sky. And there's probably like <laughs> maybe maybe that is one of the games you're thinking of, but like there's maybe like ten or fifteen that you might be thinking of. You know, maybe a few more, maybe a few less, but. There are probably like 150, 200 games that came out this year. Yeah. So I mean, the point is that, that there's always there's always going to be crap, and we're going to filter that out, and we're going to remember the good stuff. So yes, mm. we're talking about classics. Mm. Um, and now it's to sort of touch on you know having like said having being able to say you have played a Pac-Man, and what you described is very specific. Um, the experience of playing Pac-Man as it was originally intended. Yes. And I would compare that to film because like you know for instance, I, I, and I think another point just to make very briefly is that. I think it's more important to go back and play the classics or read the classics or watch the classics if you're going to be either in serious criticism of the field or if you're going to be working in the field. Sure. Um, so yeah. like, it's, it's more important that an author be well re- read than someone who's just picking up a book off of the shelf because yeah, yeah. they want something to read. Well, and the question really is just, does it have value? Mm-hmm. And so I do think that there's value yeah. there. Now, the yeah. question is now, you know, do you necessarily, if you want to understand what it was like to play to, to the way games worked back Back in this period, mm-hmm. um, do you necessarily have to go back and play the original, you know, experience, original arcade for every and, every one of these classic and, and games? Was, not necessarily. Yeah, that was the point I was going to make. Is, what I'm gonna say. say you're going into film studies, yeah. um, and you're watching one of those experimental 1940s black and white films. Right. Do you have to watch it on exactly the projector model that they would have used back well, then, on the no. type of screen they would have used? Because that sort of thing. because you can still get you're still going to have the same experience with games. It's different because because they're interactive. There is a, quite a difference and. Um, I'm sure y'all know from playing arcade games before. There's quite a difference from having, you know, a joystick in, in 
in one hand and like pushing buttons that are very large That's true. and the other versus you know a controller that you're holding in one hand and like you know both hands and you have like a d-pad mm-hmm. and i mean this is a very different experience that we're talking about yeah. from a, just a control scheme taking and and that's not even counting things like um, the ports for these games are, you know, the graphics are not going to be as good, the sound is going to be not as good, and so it's not the same experience. Now, when you're talking about specific projector models, mm-hmm. if this is, like, drastically changing the appearance of it, um, then I, you could make that argument, but I don't think for the most part that is. Now, that being said... Although you could also argue, like, maybe not the specific projector model, but, like, you know, you're watching it on, you're using a film projector with the film reel right. with the film. Yes, and see, that, and that was like what I was going to say. If you want, like, I do think there's there's some value from for watching... Um, restored versions, I should say. Mm-hmm. So, like, for example, um, if you watch, like... The HD remasters. Yes, versus, like, a, a VHS copy mm-hmm. of, like, mm-hmm. an older film. Something you, you can still get a good understanding of it, but um, you might miss some of the detail because mm-hmm. some some of the, the, the lossy nature of VHS, mm-hmm. you might miss some... Especially with if it's very old, there could be entire scenes that are missing. Mm, that can go the on, other way, though. Do you, do you remember whenever they did a full digital remaster of The Twilight Zone? It was, oh gosh, about 15 years ago whenever that technology yeah. was just coming no, out. No, you're right. You know what it looked like? Yeah. It looked like a bunch of actors on sets. Yeah. You're That's what it right. looked like. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think, I, I think. Or people who say it's right. better to watch the Star Wars prequels, like, rip your DVD to a VHS plate on a CRT. Absolutely. A small true. screen rather than seeing the now aged. It doesn't have to be CG. on a small screen if, you, if you've already ripped it to VHS. <laughs> yes, you don't have to watch point. the Star Wars prequels anyway. So um, <laughs> Just no, as an example. But, but another example of that, too, would be different versions. So, like, the original Star Wars film. Mm-hmm. So, um,. The very first Star Wars film, uh, Lucas went back and and has made multiple changes to it, Mm -hmm. of course, and not necessarily for the better. So if you, like, what does it mean to have seen that film? It means that you were uh, there in 1978 and were in the film, or in the theater, sorry, yeah, in 77 and, and saw the film. And uh, you bought a ticket, and you sat down, and and you were shocked and scared and amazed because this weird, creepy dude came out, and you couldn't see their faces, right. and you'd never seen anything like and, that before. And if you missed, and if you missed that original screening, and you waited until like you know the next year or two, I forget which. There were already changes. Um, yeah, there were already changes. So like, yes. did that person that didn't catch it the first time and then went to see it in theaters, did he really get the same? Did he did he have that same experience? It was close enough that it didn't matter. But there's was two it? there's two elements here. Right. There's two elements. The first is the physical changes to the film, and the second is the changes to our culture. Mm-hmm. See, we've been so affected by that that it's impossible for my son, who is two, when he gets old enough to be able to understand it. Next year, to watch Star Wars and see Star Wars as it was intended, it is impossible. That's it true. is impossible because he will, he will, even if I shield him from the spoiler alert fact that Darth Vader is Luke's father. Mm-hmm. Oh man, <laughs> uh, he'll know it. Yeah, you know what I mean. He's going to pick it up at school. It's 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 just like I'm your father. That's that's a wrap. Everybody says that, mm-hmm. right? You know, we all know it. That that moment, that shocking moment that came in the second film, can't be reproduced. It's too ingrained in our culture. The other thing too, and this is uh, I think a broader point that applies to um, the discussion in general. Star Wars, when it first came out, was such a feat of special effects and all this different stuff that just blew people away when they first saw it in the theaters. Also it, true. It, it had never right. been done before. Right. And to the point where I would say that, like, you know, I look back at the original Star Wars and I know this is, like, sacrilege. I don't think it's that great a film. Uh, um, don't, um, don't even bother with that. <laughs> but this is, this, and I'm not going to Don't gonna even go, say that. I'm not going to go into. It's still, <laughs> I, I'll still go on record and say I, I still think it's the best one. I, I just acknowledge it's sacrilege. But the point is. <laughs> I, 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 I'm just going to acknowledge that you're wrong. <laughs> Uh, so I don't I I just I, I appreciate it and I I don't dislike Star Wars but I think it's slightly overrated. But the thing is that like what it accomplished at the time is this is something that I would say like the the value we find in all these other things these classics that we go back and look at you need someone to be able to tell you. Why? why it was significant. You're absolutely you right. You can't just go watch Star Wars and be like, well, oh, this is this, like, if I didn't have any context. You're talking about, con- yeah, you're talking about putting, putting it into yeah. context. And exactly. That's exactly yeah. Now you're talking about the real problem that we're having with the new sequel, 7, 8, 9, as they come yeah. out. We can have an I'm your father moment, but it won't be as impactful and it won't be as meaningful because no matter what happens, mm-hmm. I mean, if, think about, I think, I think we're safe now to, to, to talk about the, the major death that happens in 7, okay? Han Solo gets killed by his son. 
Oh my gosh. We never saw a body. Whoa. He could still be alive. <laughs> oh, shut up. I know this guy's there, there, fanfiction. There was but... disturbance in the force. That's, that's... Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, the, the, the point is this. That was an echo of the Ben Kenobi self-sacrifice moment, mm-hmm. but it was an unintentional self-sacrifice. Right. That's so completely uh, post-millennial. You know what I'm saying? That's a modern thing of, oh, I'm an accidental sacrifice. I'm, I meant to, to heal my son and he killed me. Oh, the irony, right? And, and we're just so, it's so like post-truth and everything. And, it, and it's just, it's, it's dark and it's cynical and it's modern and, and it's, it's all those things. And yet it's still derivative. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So we're going to have, the, I'm calling it now, uh, reckless speculation. We're going to have an I'm your father moment of in course. episode of course. eight. We will, yeah. And whatever it is, it's going to be derivative. It's mm-hmm. probably uh, Luke being um, Ray's father. Oh no! That, that, that's, that's one of the rumors. No, what, what, what I would be more impressed gonna... with is you know if she goes, "I'm your mother." And, and then it's a time <laughs> travel. That's what I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, Luke, I am your mother. And he's like, "Wait, what?" That doesn't make any sense. That would be, or, or be we, grandmother. We, we don't know who her mother is. Assuming that Luke is the father, we don't know that that's actually actually the case. That's speculation. But it's a time travel story where she becomes her own mother. And uh, <laughs> this, is, this is getting well. Yeah, you know, Anakin weird. didn't. Have a didn't have a wait no she he had a mother he didn't have a father he, he was she's his fa- oh never mind he was conceived by the force you know well, so we were told actually there's there's a there's a concept that maybe she's a reincarnation of him I mean there's all kinds of crazy stuff out there <laughs> uh, this is the Star Wars universe why not I don't know how we got talking about Star Wars from Pac Man but <laughs> point- because we're talking about about the value that old cultural, classics. But- but cultural, yeah. cultural. Um, what's the word? What I was looking for? Not icon. Revel- relevancy or no? Sure. Um, cultural. Uh, what's what? Uh, cultural piece. What's that term? Where it's like a cultural artifact. Artifact. Thank you. Yeah. Cultural. A cultural artifact. artifact. Yes. And course. so Pac-Man is a cultural artifact. Yes. And so is Star Wars. So by the same argument. Yes. And I don't even know if I'm making this argument, but but I'm going to state it. Um, it's impossible for someone who is currently twelve to play Pac-Man and have the experience of Pac-Man as it was originally intended right. within the context of an 80s Pac-Mania because they're like, yeah, this was cool. I just played it for 10 minutes. I get it now. I'm going to go play new game that just came out. You know what I'm saying? So so this, there is no, there's no way for us to bring back the awesomeness that is Pac-Man without having lived it. Without having lived it, because no, but you never can, again will Pac-Man be the coolest thing that ever is. Right, but you can still or ex- that currently is. But you can still experience that the game itself. You mm-hmm. can still you can still have that experience in, in kind of. But in, you're right; an it's an not academic be, sort of way. Well, and but also in just you can just play it. I mean, you don't have to evaluate it. Mm-hmm. You can literally just play it. You know, it's like there there are modern games now that emulate you know indie games. We talked about these a little bit earlier mm-hmm. um, that emulate sort of an old retro style. And it's like and, yeah, and, to, and, to, and, to an extent, I, I would say too that part of it's going to be subjective taste. I think of there course. are a lot of a lot of, of people course. today who will I'm not buy, saying you have to like yeah. Pac Man either. Uh, I you think know, there some are a lot of people don't people, like some people didn't like Pac Man when it was first out. A lot of people today like the the retro aesthetic because yeah. they remember the retro aesthetic. And there's some people who just like the retro aesthetic because it's like hey, this is different and cool <laughs> and it's kind of a neat idea. Right. And um, I mentioned this when we talked about this topic too. Was that that, um, you know, I, I'm I'm pretty into going back and playing retro games, trying to discover games that were that I may have missed when I had gone through um, my period of playing games growing up. Mm-hmm. And in some of the circles, you know, that, that I go through, like different internet forums, and, and uh, also you know, obviously places on Reddit too, like different subreddits and stuff. Um, you know, I, I'm surprised to run into a lot of younger people that are going back and playing these games that are looking for games to play because they just like the style of game. You know, I've talked about, like, they like old games from on, like, the NES and the SNES and the Genesis. Sure, yeah. and, and, you know, the reason that, the reason why, you know, they, they, all, they all have their different reasons, but a, a lot of the answers keep coming back to uh, they just like to sort of like a pick up and play experience where mm-hmm. it's like a different sort of game. Yeah. Like we mentioned some last time, you know, the differences of um, what games have become, this this gradual shift to the experience and being immersed in this world versus right. versus we're going to to um, the do, the action, that we're going to play. Uh, we, we have this task, we have this level, we have this challenge, I'm going to beat it. Like I'm going to challenge myself to beat this part. Correct. And so it's a different sort of... Um, Mindset, and so it, it, it that even that by itself has some value you to sort of experience that. That, that is absolutely yeah. true. We play games now because we want to experience the game. We don't. We don't play it because we're afraid we're not going to beat it. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I, I have no doubt in my mind that I could go home and I could play for X number of hours and beat Witcher three. Sure. It might it might require me a, a few more hours than I'd like mm-hmm. to level up my character so that well, he 
if you if you raise the difficulty character. to the max, I'm not so sure. <laughs> well, that, and that's a good point. That is a very good point. Um, but but the the line but between yes, they give player you ability yeah. and character ability mm. has become so very just I mean, there's a chasm in between them, mm. right? I'm making a choice up the difficulty. Right. Whereas if you're either good at Pac-Man or you're not. And you can hone your skills and get better at it, or Galaga, or Joust, and or pick your. Age, I think you know, I your think that game. mentality still exists today in the competitive space. I agree because um, those are games that are designed specifically for player versus player. Overwatch, yes, but, but, anything MLG right. where it comes down to I am the best at this game and I'm going to beat whoever else says they're the best at this. But game. it's but it's also that it's a different experience because you are. Versus someone else, yeah. as opposed yeah. to you're, you're not against. cracking the code of the repeating, um, memorizing the levels. So you right. can beat it. The ghosts will always follow that same pattern. They will be pretty. You can get into the zone, mm-hmm. and you can beat Pac-Man because you've memorized Pac-Man. Mm-hmm. You are yourself yeah. sort of an echo of what that game is about to and do. And even in the later games, where you know they got more um, advanced, well, like random, like on on, a, on the eight bit and and say like the NES or something. Mm-hmm. Um, Enemies still had patterns. You still had to if you mastered the mechanics of the game. Correct. You could you would you could beat the game. You could react. You could yeah. You could react to whatever it throws at you because you've mastered the mechanics. Mm-hmm. So, um, but you're right. But nowadays it's 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 very different. You're expected to just mm-hmm. have this experience, and you're you're expected to. And, and Chris, you made this point before where mm-hmm. it was a lot. Plenty of people don't beat the games that they buy. Mm-hmm. Well, sure, because that's just because they choose not to. Mm-hmm. But they're still being sort of guided along yeah. this experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. So the, I guess the, to kind of bring it home, yeah. drive it home. You, you brought up a really great counter argument, Jim, mm-hmm. and it was that you know that that art and film and these other things, um, do they have value? Right, yeah. and you're talking about specific pieces needing to be individually looked at. Of course, and of course. And, and, and that I completely agree yeah. with. But by the same logic. Is it possible for us to look at Renaissance art and experience Renaissance art in the same way as the audience for that Renaissance art would have experienced it? Oh, no. Within the context of their culture and their appreciation and their love of God and their understanding of the uh, the medieval universe, uh, you know, cosmologically. Let's use Shakespeare because I think that's better. That's a great example. Shakespeare, you know, back... When, when the way that we look at Shakespeare and the way that his original audience looked at Shakespeare is completely, completely different. different. Completely different. We think of it as this very um, formal and 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 it's 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 a classic and it's um, it's like some of the most um, sophisticated and all right. this. And for them, this is the lowbrow humor. Yeah, it was. So it's it's just completely. It was different. fart humor, right? Yeah. And that's just and, it was Family Guy, right? And that's not to say that's not to say that it, that Shakespeare Shakespeare's writing wasn't clever. Or witty no, back no, it was in the day, clever. completely was. But it's the the perception of the audience and the way that it was presented. Correct. Um, they look at it so differently. Yes. So so you're right. We're not we're not going to experience it in exactly the same way. But that's not the question that you asked here. It's not can old, can old games can we go can new players go back and experience old games in the exact same way that they were when we first came out? You're that's right. not the question. The question is, does it have value? And I would say yes. There's value there. Now. You know, your mileage may vary. What's your purpose? You know, what's your purpose? Are you just trying to have fun? Uh-huh. Sure, you can find old games that, that you can have fun with, mm-hmm. of course. Um, are you trying to go back? Are you a game scholar? You want to learn the um, what's the origin of this particular type of game? What about lock-on, enemy lock-on? Where did this come from? Go back and look at, like, right. say, Ocarina of Time and mm-hmm. see why, when this is used and why it was used. Yeah. And, and so is it research? You know, what what is your – are you trying to – some sort of game study? Are you trying to be a game critic? Are you a designer? Are you a developer? Are you looking for, like – Forgotten concepts and old games that mm-hmm. were really cool ideas, and like some, there's a few games that tried it, and the games were kind of popular, but they didn't quite catch on because other games sure. overshadowed them. Maybe you can reuse some of these ideas, and maybe you can come up with something to kind of reinvigorate that. So, you know, what's your reasoning behind it? Um, but yeah, it certainly has value. That that is a fantastic answer <laughs> to the question. Mm-hmm. An absolutely fantastic answer. Chris, what are your final thoughts? Uh, I wouldn't argue with that. I would say that, you know, say say we're just talking about the the lay, just like the average gamer who's just looking at video games for entertainment, right. who is young enough that they never grew up with anything, say, before 
say the GameCube is maybe the earliest thing they remember. Sure, maybe that's yeah. even retro for them. Um, it is for some of these certainly kids. Is now. No, it is for some of these kids. Um, that's what I'm talking about. Some yeah. of these kids. I know. They they might go back and find they like even if they like these, some of the ideas of these old games or they're told by people that these old games are classics, they mm-hmm. might find it too clunky. Yeah. They might find it hard to approach. They might find it more frustrating than it's worth. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, to that I would say that like they can probably still find a game here and there that they enjoy. Um, but I don't think that it. I think for a lot of people, they're going to not have the appeal unless they're given that context, unless they give the understanding of, here's what you need to understand about this time. Right. Knowing all these things, here's the value. In it. And here's why it was significant. Mm-hmm. And then the question becomes, now that you've just told them that outright, mm-hmm. do they still need to experience it? Mm-hmm. And can they experience it? I mean, and I think also when you say layperson, I mean, what do you mean? Do you mean like... Do you mean a casual gamer? Do you mean like I mean, the person that, yeah. that plays Bejeweled and, and like Castle Crashers and that's that's their gaming experience? Mm-hmm. Or are you talking about um, the typical gamer that is playing like uh, you know, Call of Duty and Battlefield and Grand Theft Auto? Mm-hmm. So these are these are these are both both of them you could argue are casual. Mm-hmm. Really? Are they really? I don't know. I mean, if they're sinking tons of hours in both those experiences, are they really casual? And how, there's how an interesting... about a serious hobbyist gamer who right. is not a scholar, not a game yeah. scholar? Uh, yeah, and I think, like I said, there's there's, there's, separate there's games you can go back and have fun with. And um, like I said, like I was, was talking about in these communities, you find all these kids that want to go back and play. And I say kids. They're like... Um, well, some of them are kids, but uh, we're talking about <laughs> twenty-year-old you know, kids. Yeah, like yeah. Early, yeah, like like early twenties, or and some of them are you know younger. Some of them are like you know sixteen, seventeen. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're looking for different experiences, and yeah. so they can go back and they can have fun and they can find some of these games. And those are the sort of a lot of the topics you get is like recommendations for old games, sure, yeah. Like that. But yeah, to them, like to your point, Chris, mm-hmm. yeah, to them, they're to them, GameCube is retro and NES is retro. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, they understand there's a difference there, mm-hmm. but to them, it's like, what's retro? Oh, those are both retro. I mean, my game earlier, I picked 1996. That's yeah. the year that the N64 came out. And so that was a generational divide. Yeah, I was, was picking very intentionally. Yeah. And what was weird to me as I was writing that down, is like, okay, 1996 to today, that's 20 years. The N64 is just as retro now as, like, the NES was when I was young. Yeah. Which is really weird to think about. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's interesting, though. It's, it's, and then I think that, you know, in a way, there are certain things about, like, you know, we, we appreciate kind of the 8-bit, the 16-bit aesthetic. Um, and I think that in some ways that, that ages better than some of, like, the early 3D stuff. Completely agree. Completely um, agree. And yet there might be a time when we think that, uh, you know, that that aesthetic, the early 3D aesthetic, was actually, like, really interesting and really cool, and people are starting to... I mean, I've even seen some people do, not exactly like that, granted, some sort of, like, modified takes on it, but people doing, like, indie little projects about, you know, games with the early 3D aesthetic. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, going forward how people react to stuff like this. But, um... Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, just remember, the games of today, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, they'll be retro. Mm-hmm. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And there'll be a whole new crop of kids that it's are still, like, we well, don't want to play that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's still, blo- I, I will say it is blowing my mind with the GameCube because it just re- brings all that up where there's going to be the people who look at VR and it's like, you need a yeah. headset to be in yeah, virtual reality? Right. <laughs> you have to use your hands? <laughs> no, it's to, like looking at a game like Metroid Prime as like a retro game. Mm-hmm. That's to them that's a retro game. Yeah. And the met- retro and they're like, "Oh wow, that's this cool retro yeah, retro and, and game." And I, I still Prime. like just because of yeah. habit. I still think of it as the new take on Metroid. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> sadly enough it kind of still is in a yeah. way. <laughs> cool. I guess this will uh, conclude our talk. I think we I think given the the broad parameters of your question, I think we can safely say yes, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of caveats there. There's a lot of like you have to find your own purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And of course, my reason for asking the question was to explore it, not because I disagreed with it. Yeah. And it's quite possible, too. I mean, like, you know, again, drawing all these parallels between other media. I mean, there are people who absolutely love books who probably don't care for the classics. Yeah. There are a ton of people who love movies and go to movies all the time and wouldn't watch anything made before 2000 or something. Yeah, I don't know. I, I know people like that, and I'm, I mean, I continually work on them and say, come on, you gotta go back and you gotta watch some of this stuff. There's some great films that you're missing out on. Mm. Yeah. Of course, there's the flip side, too, and it's those who won't watch anything made after 2000. Yeah. Right, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that, that does exist as well. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode 86 of the backward compatiblecom podcast, our discussion on uh, the worth of retro games to new generation of gamers. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show, because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com.
and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible.